He's a brave artist. He goes his own way. And in the process, he's sold an awful lot of records. He is a consummate musician. He's always trying different things. He's got an eye for world politics. He's obviously very tapped into that kind of worldview. He's not really worried about what other people think of him. Sting was born Gordon Matthew Thomas Sumner in Wall's End, a shipbuilding town near Newcastle. His dad was a milkman called Ernie, so Sting was the milkman's son. However, um, in times of great economic hardship in a very, very depressed area, Sting's dad Ernie managed to become not just a milkman, but a dairy owner too. So although Sting's parents were divorced and there was an unhappiness in the home, Sting did not come from the wrong side of the tracks, materially speaking. After a family friend left him a Spanish guitar, Sting became obsessed with music. He spent his youth visiting jazz clubs in nearby Newcastle, where he saw the likes of Jimi Hendrix and Cream. There's a story about him creeping into clubs to watch Cream and Jimi Hendrix and stuff. So he's obsessed with music from a young age, but he's got quite a kind of, yeah, modest background. He was playing in jazz bands. So that was really his background. This is the thing about Sting, you know, say what you will about him, but I think he was a very trained musician. And he'd been working, he'd had all kinds of jobs. He was a teacher. He got the name Sting by playing in one of said jazz bands at one point and wearing a top that was yellow with brown stripes in the manner of a bee or a wasp. And some humorous individual called him Sting. In 1977, Sting moved to London to pursue music with his band Last Exit. At one of the city's jazz clubs, he met drummer Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland was a drummer in a band called Curved Air, who had a hit with Backstreet Love, who played a Newcastle Polytechnic Students' Union in 1976, um, just as Curved Air were about to expire. And after the gig, uh, Stuart Copeland asked where to go, and he was sent to see a band called Last Exit. Stuart Copeland was very impressed by the singer, Sting. And a few months later, Sting and Last Exit moved from Newcastle to attempt to crack the big time in London. And Stuart Copeland called him up and the two started the police. There was a sort of few you know, people coming and going. And then Andy Summers, the guitarist, came in. And these were very, very good musicians. Andy Summers was a jazz musician. And Stuart Copeland was a, not a jazz drummer, a sort of progressive rock guy. But this was the time of punk. It was about everything being stripped down. It was all about these kind of sharp songs. Although starting out as a punk band, the police showed a wide range of influences. None of them were punks by any stretch of the imagination. But at that time in music history, punk was what was happening. Um, and if you were as virtuistic as they were, then you could turn your hand to anything. The police were just really, really good at pop songs. I mean, they had that kind of lolloping reggae beat quite often, but they weren't a reggae band. Um, and there was something quite restrained about it all. For a start, there's only three of them, and the different musical parts just fitted in very well. I think probably the defining song is Every Breath You Take. The idea of a song about a stalker is kind of a love song, but it's a bit twisted. It's a really uh, interesting idea. That guitar thing that runs through, it's actually really hard to learn. I have actually tried, um, and it's a bit of a rite of passage to learn that. And, and don't sound so close to me and every breath you take up. Uh, uh, yeah, they are good pop songs. Roxanne, you don't have to put on the red light. I think 
Sting was largely instrumental for pushing them in a kind of reggae way and pushing them in a more pop direction as well. Sting was always the musical leader, although not necessarily the leader in terms of the very strong personalities surrounding him. And he was always trying to push the place. He was trying to push the others musically. And sometimes they were resistant to it, sometimes they weren't. But the police were his band, musically speaking. By their fifth album, The Police were the biggest band in the world. And although Synchronicity sold 8 million copies in the US alone, the trio decided to go on hiatus. In 1981, Sting had been invited to do a charity concert called The Secret Policeman's Other Ball. And suddenly there he is being asked to do something on his own. And you know, the ego gets stroked, doesn't it? And all of a sudden you're thinking, well, maybe I don't need those other guys. They were a pretty volatile band, the police. It wasn't all sweetness and light in their, um, in their camp, put it that way. Massive, massive, massive egos. The three of them, they really clearly couldn't stand each other by the end. Sting, a man of many, many talents, especially his own self-belief, you know, would have gone solo inevitably at some point. The police were absolutely massive by the time he decided to go solo. In, in America, they were probably approaching Beatles level. And in fact, they played Shea Stadium, the scene, obviously, of the famous Beatles gig. And I think at that point, Sting, I think it was Sting who just sort of said, let's, let's leave it at this. This is as good as it's gonna get. The subtext of that, of course, being that he probably thought, well, I can go solo now because everyone knows who I am. In 1985, Sting released his debut solo album, The Dream of the Blue Turtles. Sting had such commercial kudos that he could do what he wanted for his debut solo album. And of course, he ended up being this kind of jazz kid in a jazz sweet shop. And because he was Sting, he could recruit a load of musicians, such as Branford Marsalis and Kenny Kirkland and um, Eddie Grant as well. And he could make an anti-police record. You say a lot of things about Dream of the Blue Turtles, but it wasn't a police record. I quite like Dream of the Blue Turtles. I do remember buying it when it came out on vinyl. And I quite liked the cool jazz inflections to it. More than I ever really liked a police album. I like the track Russians, actually. Um, it's a really kind of moment in time. It's kind of reflecting on the Cold War and what's going on. It's a kind of social commentary. And I think it shows early on in his solo career that he's looking at what's going on in the world and kind of wanting to, to sing about it. <laughs> It was a song which was disparaging about Ronald Reagan and also about the, the former Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. And when he said Russians love their children, it was a basic point. And people said, yeah, 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 of course they do. But no one had actually articulated this before, that those Soviets who people were so scared of, they were families. They were people who loved their children too. In the same year, Sting featured on the hugely successful song Money For Nothing by Dire Straits. He sang on the chorus of Money For Nothing. If you listen, he says, I want my MTV, and it's very, very similar to Don't Stand So Close To Me. It's exactly the same tune. You play the guitar on MTV. He probably thought, well, this is going to be terrible because everyone's going to see this, the same song. And I've just used something I already had and changed the words. So uh, he didn't want to write his credit. He might, you know, might prove useful considering it became such an enormous hit. But having said that, by that point, he probably didn't even need the money.
took part in a series of special Amnesty International concerts that took him to war-ravaged countries. The experience would influence his next release, Nothing Like the Sun. songs about Pinochet's regime in Chile. He's written songs about kind of people that are persecuted. He's, he's got an eye for world politics, which is quite rare actually, like in, in British kind of pop music. Essentially, you, you get a lot of artists who are talking about what's going on at home and stuff, but Sting really kind of looks beyond that and, and addresses lots of issues that are going on around the world. It was a bridging album between the commercial success to come and the cathartic nature of not being in the police anymore, of being a man in control of his own destiny. Englishman in New York has written about Quentin Crisp, and I think it was inspired after a meeting between the two. And in a sense, it's not surprising that he wrote a song, because I don't think Quentin Crisp is the kind of person that you meet and forget about. It's interesting that the video for Englishman in New York features Quentin Crisp. But I think that Sting probably likes to see himself as being a bit Crisp-esque in as much as this slightly kind of outsider figure going against the grain. Nothing Like the Sun had dealt with the impact of the death of Sting's mother. He continued to open up his emotions on his third solo release, The Soul Cages, which was a concept album about his father's death. I think of all things you could say about Sting, his ability to convey emotion is, is really great. At this point, he's, he's going through a lot of stuff and that's coming out in his music. I think this is partially his teaching background, is that he knows how to construct a story. Say if he went back to the police and saw every breath you take, which seems very personal, but it's not, it's a yarn. And he brought aspects of his parents' death, of his northeastern upbringing, into some of his songs. And that's what songwriters do. The 1993 album, Ten Summoner's Tales, saw Sting take on a different mood with his songwriting. You remember me when the west wind moves upon the fields of Bali. You forget the sun in his jealous sky as we walk in fields of gold. Ten Summoner's Tales is, is probably Sting's best solo album. There's not a moment wasted on it, but it's also the moment where Sting is more focused than he's ever been before. He had this great success with The Police, and his early solo career was almost kicking against that. This time, he was re-embracing and reconnecting with his commercial side, and when he does that, he does it very, very well. This record was just more poppy, really. The previous material had been quite kind of downbeat and reflective, and he was going through a lot of stuff. And at this point, I think he's just kind of wanting to write big kind of pop songs. Ten Summoner's Tales was an unashamedly adult pop album, adult oriented rock to the nth degree. And it sold in enormous quantities once again. So it was obviously a smart move. The track, Shape of My Heart, which featured on the album, was sampled by the hip-hop community, bringing a new audience to Sting's work. A lot of hip-hop and R&B is based on samples, and Shape of My Heart was sampled by Nas, who is a very, very influential rapper. He's considered one of the best rappers of all. It was a bit like James Brown for a previous generation. It became one of those samples that got used again and again and again. Hip-hop artists tend to be less prejudiced about the music that they sample and that they use. And Sting has always been musically very, very tight. He's a pretty rhythmic, funky, for want of a better word, bassist. And 
if you use those sort of loops and those samples and his voice, which is very difficult to pin down as to where it's from, it's an international singing voice, then if they use that, a bit of his bass, they've got something to build on. So yeah, why not use Sting? I mean, it just goes to show that the hip hop and the R&B world, they don't care about sampling Captain Beefheart or the Rolling Stones or whatever. They just want a strong, well-written melody. Whilst working on the soundtrack for the Disney film The Emperor's New Groove, Sting took an adult-oriented direction for his album Mercury Falling. It didn't match the commercial success of his past, but still featured a hit single in Let Your Soul Be Your Pilot. I mean, the idea of someone of, in their 40s writing an adult pop song about taking ecstasy and how you should let your soul be your pilot. I mean, this is 1996, so ecstasy is not a hot topic of conversation. It was obviously just something that he was into, and he decided to write about it, however embarrassing other people might think it'd be. So one thing you can say about Sting is that he's not really worried about what other people think of him. The same year as Mercury Falling, rapper Puff Daddy sampled the police's Every Breath I Take for a tribute to the murdered rapper Notorious B.I.G. It raised a new interest in Sting, and his next album, Brand New Day, would become a huge seller. Brand New Day was a massive success. I think at this point, I'm just kind of flabbergasted that he's still doing so well in a way. Like, people are still wanting to buy his records. He's become to that level where people are kind of still kind of really interested in what he's doing and buying it by the bucket load. So it's a real achievement for him. That was a funny period for Sting because it was very commercially successful. I didn't really like it because he started sort of using all these different world music things, which is a bit like a trope, you know, it seemed like sort of almost symbolic and sort of, you know, look at how big my world is. But at the same time, I mean, he's meant to be this environmentalist. Desert Rose was used on a Jaguar ad, and I think uh, Brand New Day was used on an app for credit cards or something. So there's a lot of money splashing about in, in this kind of ethnic mix. <laughs> He's got this world view and he's sung in Portuguese and Spanish and kind of experimented with singers kind of from all around the world and I think that's kind of what makes him stand out. He was working with Greek musicians and with Asian musicians and this was just another little bit on his plate. He's always been like that. Experimenting with different sounds would set the template for Sting's most recent work. Sacred Love explored R&B, and songs from the labyrinth used classical instruments from the past. He's made all the money in the world. He's sold all the records it's possible to sell. And he's made a, an album with a Bosnian lutist, it's not bad at all. He's made classically tinged records. He's made soundtracks. He's done a play about his northeastern upbringing, and he's made an album of that. He's a man who can do what he wants to do. It's not taking chances anymore. It's just following his muse. There's good stuff on all Sting's later albums. He's done so much stuff around the world. I mean, he's made all kinds of different albums. You have to concede that it is a genuine passion of his. He's still experimenting now. He's experimenting with classical music. He sort of tries out literary themes on them. He did an album as well that was just purely him and songwriters from the Northeast <laughs> and singer. And, you know, the fact that he's still doing that at this age, I think, is to be applauded, really. It's really impressive. Sting is not influential in the way that some of his contemporaries might be. Bearing in mind that he came up at the time of the Sex Pistols and the Clash, he's not influential in that sense, but he is enormously successful and has had an impact on the R&B and hip-hop fraternity. I think, actually, if you look, 
He's not a typical pop star. He's actually followed his path and gone, you know, from making a loot album to doing reggae with the police or whatever it is. You know, it's actually quite interesting. His influence, I think, is like a lot of these people. They kind of got to get over a certain period. It's almost like they've got to stop being contemporary. And at that point, everyone starts thinking, oh, actually, there's, there's, you know, a lot of those Sting albums were actually pretty good.